Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. It is very popular for the world to think that there is hope with humanity, that generally people are good. But when we compare those thoughts to the Word of God, we have to acknowledge that this is not the case. We saw yesterday in Yehuda's speech what he wrote down, what he revealed to us. We saw that there are people who are rebellious, those who are led by their own desires and not the purposes, not the will of God. And that tendency produces that from God's perspective which is evil. And it's that evil that will bring about the judgment of God. Now, we concluded yesterday in verse 11 of this epistle of Jude, and he writes about those who were like Cain, those who wanted to worship God, serve God, but according to their ways, their thoughts, their desires. That same spirit that the sons of Aaron had when they offered up a strange fire, having been told you cannot just enter into that holy place anytime you want. You can't just offer up any type of incense, but everything by the word, by the instructions of God. They rebelled. Or like Bilam, who wanted wages. He was interested in financial remuneration. And therefore, instead of doing what he knew was right, he twisted the instructions of God in order that he could, in the end, profit according to his desires. And then finally, Korak, this one who would not submit to God's leadership, would not acknowledge the authority that God gave to Moses. And he led that great rebellion that entered into a period of God's judgment upon that household. So we see that God is faithful when there is those tendencies, those actions, those behaviors to go after one's own will rather than the will of God What we have seen and what we'll continue to see today is that God is faithful. He's faithful to his character, and therefore he will punish sin. He will bring his vengeance upon disobedience, and he will consume eternally those who are rebellious. Take out your Bible and look with me to where we left off yesterday the epistle of Jude, and now we're ready for verse 12. Once more, it's speaking to those who have that same character that walk in this world, that is, behave, live out, based upon that same way of thinking that people like Cain and Bilam and Korak had. He says in verse 12, these are the ones at your love feast. Now, We need to be very specific with the words. Whenever we deal with scripture, we need to remember we're dealing with words. And in actuality, the word feast isn't in the text. It's simply the word love, but it's in the plural. It's a noun. And most scholars agree that we're speaking about a time of fellowship that believers would would share among themselves for the purpose of encouraging one another, for periods of of worship, fellowship, 
for strengthening one another for service. But what we find, and we remember this yesterday, there were certain individuals that crept in, that entered into the congregation and here, entered into these times of fellowship when, when one should show love and care for others. And what were they? Notice very careful the language. And many of the modern translations, they, don't, they do not translate what the word literally is. Once more, these are the ones in your love feasts. And he uses one word. And this is a word that speaks about rocks, and we're speaking about sharp rocks. How it's used is in regard to those who travel upon the sea. And these sharp, jagged rocks are very dangerous. The ship must avoid them because if the ship does not, these rocks can bring about great damage and even death. And this is how Yehuda is speaking about these individuals who are led not by the Spirit. In fact, they are without the Spirit, which shows that they are not true believers. And what he says about them, they are dangerous. They are like these sharp, jagged rocks that can do great damage. And then he points out that they are, are among us they're fellowshipping, they're speaking with, they are participating with us. But notice what he says, they are without fear. Now, this word fear speaks of a reverence for God, a sensitivity to the holiness of God, recognizing God's ultimate and absolute authority. They reject that. They're not interested in God's authority. We saw that yesterday. They reject that. They ignore that. They deny that. And therefore, these individuals, once more it says, they are without fear, and then they feed. This is why they're there. They're not there to edify. They're not there to strengthen one another, encourage one another, learn from one another, assist one another. They're there for one purpose, and that is themselves to feed. And the emphasis is on the word themselves. That's who they care about. They do not have, and this is a very important biblical truth, they do not have a Torah character. What's a Torah character? Well, when we look at the two greatest commandments that really define and, and illuminate for us the purpose of the Torah, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. They didn't love God, and they weren't interested in their neighbor. The emphasis of their lives were themselves. And therefore, literally, you can translate that word to feed themselves, but it's literally the word they were shepherding themselves. They had no one leading them, no one governing them, no authority over them. They were self-shepherds. That's literally what it says, for their own pursuits. So Jude makes this very clear. He goes on to say that they are clouds without water. Now, we need to remember the author, Yehuda, Jude, a Jewish man. According to tradition, the half-brother of our Lord and Savior, Messiah Yeshua. And therefore, sometimes to understand the intent of the text, we need to understand it from the cultural background. And in Judaism, within the Jewish culture, rain is seen as a blessing. So when these clouds come carrying water, we're, we're thankful. In fact, in Judaism, now that we're in the, the fall, every day we pray for the wind to bring the clouds so that it will rain. In Israel now, we're in what we hope to be the rainy season because from Passover until Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, there is no rain. This is the only opportunity 
So rain is seen as a blessing, but these, they give a false impression. There are clouds, that's how they present themselves, but without water, meaning they don't have any ability to bless. Why? Because they're not interested in being a blessing. Now, we've talked about a Torah character, but there's also the character of the Abrahamic covenant. And I would, would suggest to you that they share that same character. But when we look at the Abrahamic covenant, what do we know about that? It is a covenant of change that is entered into by faith with the purpose of being a blessing. I mean, you only need to look at Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, where it speaks about that, that nation that will come from Avram, soon to be called Avraham. And in that nation, in that seed, the scripture says, and this is God's desire, this is potential, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So they're not interested in being a blessing. Their, their thoughts, their focus of their life is once again on themselves, not upon blessing others. And that's why they're called here, clouds without water. And then we find that by the wind, and this is not in, in Greek, there are two different words for wind. Now, we can use the word that many times translated spirit. Just like in Hebrew, the word ruach can mean spirit, as in the ruach hakodesh, the Holy Spirit. Or we can talk about a ruach hazakah, a strong wind in the natural sense, having nothing to do with the spirit, but simply a wind. Now, in Greek, pneuma can be used in those same two ways, but there's also an additional word, which means only a wind in a natural sense. And that's the word that's used here. In other words, Jude was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this down to say these individuals have no, no connection whatsoever with the Spirit of God but rather they're not led by the Spirit, but it says here that they are, are carried around by the wind. They are, and he gives short descriptions. They are like, he says here, trees of the fall. Now, a tree in the fall, this is not the time for trees to produce uh, their yield, their harvest. So it says here, fall trees without fruit. And then he uses another expression, having died twice. What does he mean here? Well, they are physically dead in the sense that they do not have true life. They are heading for physical death and the second death is spiritual. They are going to die physically and they are dead spiritually. He wants to emphasize with this phrase, twice dead, that there's no life. There's nothing in regard to God's purposes. Why? Messiah says, I've come. You all know this verse. I've come that you might have life. Remember what Messiah said in speaking about the patriarchs. He's the God of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. He's not a God of the dead, but of the living. But when Jude describes these individuals, he wants to say that they are twice dead. There's nothing that represents anything having to do with God. And finally, he says, they have been uprooted. Now, why use that expression, uprooted? And it's in the passage, which means it is their selfish desires. And we're going to see the Jude is going to speak several times about these, these ill-placed desires. And these wrong desires, they have an impact upon people. When you want the wrong thing, that is an invitation to the enemy to come and begin to manipulate you, deceive you, and use you for his shameful purpose rather than God's glorious purpose. So they have been uprooted. In other words, there is no stability in their life. 
And that's why, as we saw earlier, that it's so easy for them to be tossed to and fro. That they are not stable. They have no roots, so they've been uprooted. Look now to, to verse 13. Violent or roaring or wild waves of the sea. Now, usually in the scripture, we've seen some Psalms where it speaks about the waves roaring. Sometimes the word is used for humming. It makes a noise of power. And oftentimes these waves are related to the glory of God, the presence of God, God's work. But here we see quite the difference. And it's to show a mis appropriation. They have intrinsically resources. God has given them life, but because they are choosing that rebellious way, they're not experiencing life. I'm speaking about physical life. They are walking dead. Both physically and spiritually, they do nothing that reflects what God sees as life. And that's why he writes here, in regard to these strong, roaring waves of the sea. And then he has a word for, we all see this, the waves uh, foam. But that foam is to show, and this can be kind of like white caps on the sea. We see that this foam represents the power. But here, it doesn't represent power but rather it represents what the scripture says, their own shamefulness. So instead of being a wave that shows the glory, the power of God, these waves concerning them manifest their own shamefulness. Now, we need to pause and ask ourselves a question, and that is, what are we manifesting? Our decisions, our pursuits, our objectives, what we're about. Are we going to, if we were successful in completing what we want, would that end in a manifestation of shame before God? Or would our purposes and plans that we're committed to do just the opposite and be a manifestation of God's glory? In the scripture, we see simply a dichotomy between two approaches to life. One recognizes the authority, the truth of God. That's called faith. And the other one recognizes and is, is moved by the desires of man, separate from any revelation from God. He says, likewise, now most of the English translations... They, they do not pay attention to the context, the biblical backgrounds, and the nature of this word. It will say that they are like uh, wandering stars, going to and fro, wandering about. But this is not what that word best means. It speaks about literally deceiving stars. Now, why deceiving stars? Well, everything has a biblical basis. So when that word stars come up, we should think, where do we see the first occurrence of stars in the Bible? We don't have to go very far. First chapter of the book of Genesis, the fourth day. Chapter 1, I believe, verse 14. It speaks about how stars were for, for signs and seasons. In other words, they provided revelation. They guided people, but not these. These are deceiving stars. If you look to them, you are going to, if you follow them, you are going to experience deception. They're not going to lead you to the revelation of God. Why? Because they have a unrighteous, ungodly, unholy testimony. The most important thing that you can possess in this world is your testimony. And I wonder how 
much we really emphasize and thank and pray that we would have a God-pleasing testimony, one that is praiseworthy. These individuals did not. They are not wandering stars, but rather deceiving stars. Who? It says, and this is this phrase, and I struggle with translating it because we have two words for darkness. One is a natural darkness, and we spoke about this uh, yesterday, earlier on in the, the biblical text, when we were looking at another scripture where it spoke about the chains of, of darkness. Well, this is that same word, the first word, for a thick darkness, a paralyzing darkness. The darkness that is so thick that it makes it unable for one to move. And we read here that such individuals, these shameful ones, they, the Bible reveals, in this thickness of darkness, forever, it has been reserved, meaning this, that this thick darkness has been reserved for them for eternity. That's what they're going to experience. No change. An absence of the revelation of God. And don't forget, with this darkness comes suffering, eternal suffering, God's judgment that is poured out as eternal fire. So this is what their future is. Secondly, it says, look now to verse 14. Darkness has been kept for them forever. That's what their future is. But notice, if, if we don't want that, there is a solution. And that solution is prophetic revelation. Now, things are written in the scripture for a reason. And when we look at this, we see that we're speaking about one from, as well, the book of Genesis. And he's spoken of, his name is Chanok, or Enoch. And Chanok in Hebrew, we're told here that this one is the seventh from Adam. Now, nothing happens by chance in the word of God. Everything is purposeful. And the number seven... Seven speaks to holiness, and holiness relates to God's will, God's purposes. So Hanok, the seventh one from Adam, he prophesied. And he prophesied about God's ultimate, his will being fulfilled. And how is that going to come about? Well, we don't have to guess. He tells us clearly. He says, behold, that is a word of of gaining one's attention. And prophecy should always, always gain people's attention. It is shameful. It is offensive for believers, disciples of Messiah, not to be diligently studying prophecy. And therefore, read here, the seventh one of Adam, Hanok, he prophesied, and notice, saying, behold, the Lord, and here again, things are not by chance in the scripture. Now, many of the English translations and other languages as well, they will say, well, we're not going to translate it what it really says, because it doesn't make sense. This is a future event, and it is. It is a future event. But when we look at the verb here for the Lord, and of course the Lord, we're speaking about Mashiach, that is Messiah. We're speaking about Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And he is coming. He will come. But here it says, he has come. He came. Now, why is it in the past? If it's speaking about an event that is yet to happen, we know that we're speaking about an event that takes place at the end of this age. 
When Messiah comes to judge, not speaking about our blessed hope, the rapture, but the second coming when Messiah does not gather up people to him in the, the sky and takes us to heaven, but rather we're speaking about his second coming to earth where he would administer his judgment. And after that judgment, he will establish his kingdom. Why is it in the past this word he came? Because this is a Hebraic tendency. Many times in the Hebrew language, that is in the Old Testament, it speaks about prophetic things in the past tense. Why? Because it is as good as done. Even though it hasn't happened because God has said it, we can be assured it most certainly will happen. Secondly, the Greek language can use the past tense for another purpose. And that is speaking about an activity, a happening, an action in its wholeness, in its completion, in its entirety. Meaning this, when Messiah comes, we say when he came, because it speaks about him when he does come in the future, he will completely, entirely, wholly accomplish the purpose of God. So that's why Hanok says the seventh one from God, behold, the Lord comes among a mildred. Now, this is a word. Some will say it means 10,000, but it's simply an idiom for a great number. So when Messiah comes, his second coming, not speaking about the rapture, but when he comes at the end of Daniel's 70th week, at the end of those final seven years, at the end of him pouring out his wrath, we see that he's not coming alone. It says a Mildred, a great number of, of people will be with him. And who are these individuals? Well, it says among a Mildred, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of his saints. And, and this is why we need to pay attention to the scripture. Because many, for example, the Eastern Orthodox Church, when it speaks about the millennial, they'll say the church is in the heaven during the millennial. That, that the millennial kingdom is only for Israel and, and the nations, not for the church. But the scripture says when Messiah comes back, we are going to be with him. And we're going to reign and rule with him. This whole separation between Messiah and, and the church for the millennial kingdom is a false teaching. Did not Messiah say, for example, in John, John 14, that where I am, you shall be always? So we need to pay attention to scripture and not just go with some, some ill-guided theologians and things that they say because they do not understand how to interpret God's word. Look now to verse, verse 15. Now in verse 15, I want to speak, before we read it, I want you to be aware that there's going to be two words. The word for all or every, that word is going to appear four times. Secondly, the second word, which is probably more significant, is, is this word that we see Asebias. And this word means, and we encountered it a couple times yesterday, it's a word for that which is ungodly, that which is lewd, licentiousness. But we can just translate it, as I'll do with this verse, ungodly. And that same word appears four times. So we have two words, both of them appear four times in this verse. Secondly, that word which means ungodly, it can be used as a noun, referring to a, a ungodly person. It can be used as a adjective describing such a person. Or it can be used, as it is here one of the times, as a verb 
that speaks of doing that which is ungodly. And notice what Jude says. Now, here again, I'm, I'm looking at the Greek text. I'm translating it the most literal way possible, according to the order, and that's why sometimes how I render a verse, the words are out of order in your Bible because the translators did that. They changed the order. I don't want to do that. Look at verse 15. Speaking about the Lord, Messiah, he is going to make judgment against all. First use of that word all. There's four more coming. He is going to, we might say, execute. It's a simple word for make or doing, performing, carrying out. This one, Messiah, he is going to make judgment against all. And not just judge, but we have a word for, for reprove or convict. And this is a word of exposing. He is going to judge them and expose their ungodliness, their unrighteousness, their rebelliousness. In other words, God's judgment, I'm speaking about God the Son, Yeshua. His judgment is going to manifest truth. This is so important. And, and truth is foundational, is it not, for our faith? In fact, in Hebrew, the same root Hebrew word is used for both faith and truth to show this, this close relationship between faith and truth. So God's judgment manifests truth. He affirms his judgment rewards that which is good. And that same judgment punishes that which is evil. Good meaning with God's will, evil against God's will. So Messiah, this one, and we're going to be with him, showing that we affirm what he's doing. What's he going to do? Look again at verse 15. To make or to execute judgment against all of them. And to convict, here's the second time, all, all of their ungodly ones. Now, this is the first time in this verse the word ungodly appears. Concerning all, all their ungodly deeds. So here we see both the word all and the word ungodly together. He is going to do what? Once more. He is going to convict all of their ungodly ones concerning all their ungodly deeds, which, and here's this word again, ungodly, in the verbal construction. All their ungodly deeds which they have done, the ungodliness that they have performed. And concerning all of their, and the next word is hard or harsh words. These individuals that are going to experience the judgment of God, who are going to have their unrighteousness, their ungodliness exposed and punished, it is because, very simply, for all their harsh words which they have spoken against him. Now, when you look at this in the original language, there's a word that, that repeats twice. It's the word kata. In this use, against. And we see something. We see God executing judgment against them. Why? Because they spoke against him. And not only did they speak, but they carried out their ungodly thoughts, their ungodly words, having done ungodly actions. So this verse speaks powerfully and consistently about God's judgment. And that's why if people say, well, you know, I, I don't teach much from the Old Testament because I like to focus upon the New Testament and that encouraging message. Well, when you look at the, the New Testament, we find God's judgment repeatedly appearing. And I find encouragement. 
that God, he forgives sins, he makes the believer a new creation. And ultimately, those who are ungodly, that is, those who present a character against the kingdom, ungodliness represents the kingdom of this world. Holiness, righteousness, the glory of God represents the character of his kingdom. So he is going to, he is going to punish all those who speak harshly against him. And who are these ones? They are ungodly sinners. That's the last use of that term ungodly in this verse. Ungodly sinners. They were sinners because they pursued that which is ungodly. And what we can derive from that is they didn't do it out of ignorance. They spoke against him. They were in opposition. You know, so frequently people are, are always wanting to give kind of a, a, a way out because, well, maybe they did not know. What the Bible says is this. The fool has said there is no God. And that word fool speaks about someone who speaks against what he knows. In that word for fool is an element of rebelliousness. So people are not in, in unawareness. They're in rebelliousness. This is what the scripture is telling us. Look now to verse 16. These, notice, the focus of this section is the ungodly. Those who walk in rebelliousness and what's going to happen to them. And why is this also given to us within a, a last day context? Because the world is becoming more and more and more and more corrupt. The differences between a believer and a non-believer, those differences are becoming greater and greater. What used to be affirmed by, by most people, even if they weren't believers, there was what we speak in English, a common decency. There was a, a general acceptance of morality. <laughs> Not anymore. That common decency, that, that definition of, of morality has been done away with. And that's exactly what Jude is warning us. For us to realize that we're called to be different. And not only are we called to be different, but frequently, frequently, we're going to go it alone. That, that we're not seen, and be very, very careful to who you're allowing to fill your minds and your hearts because those who teach that, that we are approaching a great revival throughout the world, that is false. We do not see it. Now, I know the verses they go to. Yes, the Holy Spirit is going to move mightily in the last days among the remnant. Pay attention to what the word of God says. The time of the nations are coming to an end. And God's going to turn to Israel. Now, here's what false teachers are saying. I believe they have a self-serving motivation. But they're saying, we need to focus on Israel. That's wonderful. I agree with them. But this is what they say. Focus on Israel because... See, Israel's rejection of the gospel brought about great salvation among the nations. Therefore, if they're forsaking their rejection of the gospel, brought about great, great salvation among the nations, what will their acceptance be? And they infer this last day revival. But that's not what the scripture says. Paul answers that question, his own question, and he says what it is. It brings about when Israel gets right with God, it does not produce a last day revival. Not taught in the scripture. What it produces is life from 
the dead. What's that? Resurrection. It's a reference to resurrection, and when the resurrection is mentioned, you should think of kingdom. When Israel gets right, it is going to bring about a kingdom. Now, also, we're going to see Israel's used during that millennial kingdom to be truly what they should have been in this age, and that is a light to the nations. Yes, there's going to be a remnant of the nations. Notice what I said, remnant of the nations. Ezekiel speaks about that. Jeremiah speaks about this. Isaiah speaks about this. When Israel gets right with God, when, when the nations, a small remnant, not the greatest last days revival this world has ever seen. Don't see that in the scripture. What the scripture tells us, as there's going to be God's covenantal faithfulness to Israel, a remnant of the nations are going to see that, and they're going to be brought to belief in the God of Israel. Praise God for that. But from a larger standpoint, a general standpoint, Israel won't be brought to faith in that great outpouring of faith among the Jewish people in the last days when they look upon the one who has been pierced. That's after the time of the fullness of the Gentiles has come to an end. That's what the scripture says in the book of Romans chapter 11. That's what we see prophetically. So we need to be very careful in what we're, we're hearing from others. What does the scripture tell us? Look now to verse, verse 16. In speaking to these evil ones, he says, these are the ones who murmur or grumble, who complain according to their own desires, they go. So according to their own desires, and notice something. In the Greek, this word for going is in the passive. What does this tell us? See, it's not that they go in their own desires, but it's their own desires that lead them. See, that's the spiritual law. And if you miss this, you're missing out on a truth that can greatly impact your life. What I desire is going to propel me, move me. So if I don't have kingdom desires, I'm going to be led by that which is not according to the kingdom. But if I have kingdom desires, those desires of the kingdom are going to lead me. These individuals, ones that God are exceedingly displeased with, the scripture says, they are the ones that murmur, grumble, complain, and according to their own desires, they are led. And according to what says, their mouth speaks. And how does their mouth speak? It's a word for excessively. Perhaps we could use the word over the top. Some Bibles, I think, use the, the adjective swelling. And then they use an idiom where it speaks literally about marveling the face. What is that? It's an idiom. It means flattering. So these two concepts go together. They speak excessively for the purpose of flattering others. And why do they do that? For the purpose of encouraging? No. It says here why they do it. On account of profit. On account of gain. They say what they say, not to be an encouragement, but rather they say these excessively flattering terms in order to manipulate because they're pursuing gain, profit. And by the way, when you look at the original language, the word order is switched. It doesn't say on account of gain, on account of profit. It says profit for the sake of. It's emphasizing what is important to them, why they behave the way they behave. And that is for the sake of profit, their own personal gain. Look at verse 17. 
but you. And this is the conjunction that shows a difference. But you, beloved ones, we're called to be different, greatly different, noticeably different. Notice what the scripture says. But you, beloved, be reminded. Now, if your Bible says remembering, not quite. Once again, it's in the passive. It is a commandment, first of all, where God says, be reminded of something. Not just remember, but there's a cause that will make you remember. That's the point, the nuance of the text. See, if, if I just tell you, remember this, you say, I'll try, I'll do my best, I'll remember it, I hope I will, you won't. What causes you to be mindful of that, be reminded of that? He tells us, be remembering, be reminded of the words that were spoken before by who? By the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the message. Be mindful. That's how we remember the things that we're called to remember. When we're mindful of, making mention of is literally how it can be translated. Making mention of the words in the plural of the apostles of our Lord. It doesn't say Savior. He's our Savior. He's our God. But it says here, our Lord. It means to approach these words in an attitude of submissiveness. Wanting to be taught and wanting to be conformed to God's revelation. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time that you prayed? God, conform me to your revelation. That I might be lack, like what your word reveals. So you, brethren, be reminded of the words spoken before by the apostles of our Lord, Messiah Yeshua, verse 18. Because they were speaking to you, here it is, that in the end time. Now, we oftentimes say the end times, but here it simply says the end time. This is speaking about the last days. What I mentioned yesterday this transition period from this age to the age to come. And the age to come is that kingdom age of the millennial kingdom. So we read here that it's vital, it's a necessity that we be mindful of, that we be reminded of the words of the apostles and what they were saying, that in the last days there will be scoffers, maybe your Bible says mockers. It speaks about people that, that approach the things of God in a very frivolous way, not serious. Be serious-minded believers. No one is going to be disciplined because God says, you know, you took my word too serious. Don't see anyone ever being punished, ever being spoken against by God, by one of his leaders, because they were too committed, too serious in regard to the word of God. But the opposite we see all the times. So here's an example. He says, because they were saying to you that in the end time, there will be scoffers according to their own here it is. Their own desires, they, they are led. The second time, it's in the passive. Being led, it's causative. They go where they are led, and what leads them, what caused them to go in this direction? Their own desires. That's what the Word of God tells us. And these desires, it says, and here's another time, their own desires are what? Well, he uses an adjective. That same word that we talked about earlier, asibis, ungodly. That which is in rebellion to the things of God. 
That which is precious to God, we put no value on. That's what that word means. It's a word of refusal to bow the knee, to worship God, to embrace the things that are pleasing to God. It is a word that says what's important to God, I see no relevance in for my life. That's who he's speaking about here. And we further see, look now to verse 19. These are, some Bibles say, divisive. They are dividing. Now, I'm reading from the Greek text, the Textus Receptus. Most of your Bibles, if you're not looking at the King James, you are, are having a translation that's based upon the Nestle Allen, a later and a, a Greek text that its purpose was never, and I want to say this, was never to be a better and improved. Its purpose was to be a different Greek text, to show the major difference if there's a difference in a text. Now, the verse we have here, there's a word. Now, this word has appeared so many times. It's themselves. We see that over and over. Now, the Texas Receptus has it here. But, but, Nestle Allen does not. Why doesn't it? Because some manuscripts don't include it. Nestle Allen takes the major variant. Not the best, but the major variant, the largest disagreement to the recognized text. They put the one down that's different. So what it says here, read it very carefully. These are the ones who literally, it's not causing device, divisiveness, but rather they are dividing themselves. Now we learned something. A house divided cannot stand. Being divisive among yourself means that you are instable, that you are not going to have the foundation, the strength to, to build and be edified. So these are the ones some other rendering of this word has to do with uh, uh, another aspect, but for the sake of time, it says here, these are the ones that are dividing themselves, and why? What causes them to be dividing themselves unstable? It's because the next word speaks of that. Most of your Bibles will say sensual, but, but literally, it's a word that speaks of the natural. That which can be touched, seen, experienced. So that which deals with the senses, that's when it says sensual, it means of the senses. If they can't see it, touch it, smell it, feel it, if they can't do that, they reject it. They deny it. That's what it says here. And, and they do not have, notice what the scripture says, the spirit not having. They don't have the spirit, meaning they're not disciples. Verse 20. But you, we're different. But you, beloved ones, with your holy faith. There's a difference. They are basing everything based upon their senses. We're basing our life on what? The truth of God. A holy faith, a faith that reveals the purposes of God. See, they don't subscribe to anything that they can't fill, that doesn't speak and gratify their physical senses. But we're different. We are those who are led by a holy faith. That's what he's saying here. And therefore, we are being edified, that holy faith edifies ourselves. And what does it cause us to do, this holy faith? In the Holy Spirit, praying. What this tells us is this, that the holy faith causes us to pray in the Holy Spirit. Faith leads to prayer. 
What does that mean? What's the practical aspect? Faith causes us to recognize our dependence upon God and not just to recognize it, but to, to trust Him, to depend upon Him, to rely upon Him. That's what the Scripture is telling us. Verse, verse 21. And yourselves in the love of God, you keep. That's what it literally says. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Expecting, accepting is another way to translate this, accepting and expecting the mercy of our Lord. Who is our Lord? Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. For that mercy produces in us, what does it say? For eternal life. And that phrase, eternal life, means kingdom life. I say this frequently. This word eternal is a word that describes, it's the chief adjective of the kingdom. Eternity just doesn't speak about time without end. But that word in the biblical language for eternity also speaks about a, a quality, a description of that time without end. And the description is that which is of the kingdom character. That's what the mercy of God produces within the believer. Verse 22. Now, verse 22 speaks here, speaks here about how we need to, to administer our lives in regard to others. Verses 22 and 23 are a little bit difficult to translate. It says, and upon some be, be merciful, and that is being able to, to exercise discernment. Now, some will say doubting, but it's really not doubting. It's being able to make a distinction. So there are some, and you need to administer mercy, share the mercy of God with them. But upon others, this same distinction needs to be made. And in fear, you save. Now, when it says in fear, in fear of the, the fire. And what are we supposed to do? Save them from the fire, out of the fire, and then we have a word. That word is the same word that appears in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, where it speaks about being caught up, taken away, snatched away at a very quickly being done at a quick pace. And what we find here is this. In the same way, and it's a word that, that really describes and the basis for the rapture. So many people say, oh, the word rapture is not in the Bible. That's not really true what they're saying. Because the word for being snatched away, where in the Latin translation they use a word, and in English that word that they use for being snatched away, is where we come away with the word rapture from. This is that same word. So it means to snatch them away, to take them away rapidly, to remove them. It's a change. This is what's important. It's a change in location that we save them from that fire. And then look at the end of verse 23. We should hate something. Now, I remember my mom always say, never use the word hate. Don't hate anything. But biblically, she wasn't right. Love her, but she was wrong here. It says here that we are to hate also the garment that was stained or defiled by the flesh. Meaning this, garment is frequently a word that's used for, for deeds. When someone is dressed in white garments, clean garments, they have deeds which represent purity, holiness, the purposes of God. So we're supposed to hate what stains the garment and even that garment, that deed. Now, it's speaking here about this, not hating the person, but hating the, the deeds of that person. What they have done, not who has done it. Finally, we see 
in the end of this verse. Look now to verse 24 and 25. This is kind of the benediction. And this is how we're going to wrap up our, our conference with these two verses. So appropriate for a benediction, a blessing. Jude concludes with these words, but to the one, and that one is the Lord, but to the one who is able, and, and this is such, not only is it truth, but it is so comforting. And now to the one who is able to keep you from stumbling and to establish you before his glory. Just think of this. It is God and God alone who is able to keep me from stumbling. I'm not going to fall away from him. His promise, it's not dependent upon me. Once I enter into a covenant, see, read what it says in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31. It's not like the covenant I made with your forefathers when I brought them out of Egypt. That's the Mosaic law. Why? The, the responsibility was on the people to keep and maintain that covenant. We couldn't do it. We failed. We stumbled and fell. But the new covenant, that, that burden of maintaining it, praise God, it's on him and not me. Not on you, on him. And therefore, Yehuda, J Jude is excited, he says, but to the one who is able to keep you from stumbling and to stain you, establish you before his glory. And he's going to do that, making us blameless and, and this is a word for exceedingly great joy. Great verse. Who does this? The only wise God, our Savior. Now, remember, in this, we know who the Savior is. It's the Son of God, Messiah. He is going to stand us before God's glory, blameless, with great joy. He's the only wise God, our Savior. And then we conclude, glory and, what a great word, majesty. Glory and majesty and dominion, that word can mean power, and finally, authority. Think of those four words. Where he says, glory and majesty and power and authority now and also always into the ages, beating forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you that you are indeed that only wise God. We praise you that you can keep us forever from stumbling, and not by works that we have done, but the work that your son, Yeshua, the work that he did upon that cross, he transforms us, that power of the cross, the shedding of his blood, to be people who are seen as blameless before you. And because of that hope which will not dis disappoint, we have that glory. We praise you, we honor you, we thank you, we worship you. And Lord God, we at this time open up to you to move. And those who are, are watching, listening, and we pray that whatever decision that one needs to make to be pleasing to you, perhaps to receive your forgiveness, to take hold of your mercy by saying, yes, I have been led by my evil desires, but God, I want to change. If that describes you, pray that. God, I do not want to be led by my evil desires. I want you to change me, save me from the consequence of my sin in this world and in the age to come. Forgive me by the blood of your son who died upon that cross, but, but although he was buried, I believe with my heart, he rose on that, that first day of the week, on the third day, signifying 
deliverance, victory over sin and death. God, this is what I want. I want forgiveness, but I want victory. Not to live under the authority of sin, but to be free and liberated for the purpose of serving you. Father God, my hope, my prayer is that there will be many who desire to turn away from sin and to walk with you. Knowing that their future, that eternal life, that that great rejoicing belongs to them. Not because of what they've done to earn it, but because they were humble enough and listened to your revelation of your scripture. That they might take hold of your truth, that gospel, the only good news of salvation. Through the only Savior, Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. That they might have the experience, the eternal experience of being presented before you in the midst of your glory, in the midst of your presence. Lord, we thank you for that hope. Lord, we pray as well for those who are hurting, those who are are empty inside, those who are confused, those who are are sick. Lord, we pray for a, a restoring We pray for healing. We pray for a complete healing of mind, body, and spirit that you might turn individuals that are lacking, hurting, whatever, into healed vessels that can serve you and be instruments of your righteousness, can be tools that you use to bless others. For this is our prayer. In Messiah's name, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. And we all say, Amen. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.